competencies for community engagement. My name is Rachel Forensic and I'm a project director at Banyan Communications and I'm here today with Chris Soderquist of Pontifex Consulting. Chris Soderquist has over 20 years experience as a strategy and leadership consultant and educator with a diverse set of clients from both the private and public sectors. Chris's most recent focus areas include adaptive learning and leadership, collective impact, impact processes, community and regional well-being, NGO strategic planning, and local community-based sustainability efforts. Additionally, his research interests include linking dynamic modeling with social network analysis, as well as dashboard and scorecard development, implementation, and monitoring. Some of Chris's clients include the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Bank, United Nations, World Economic Forum, the states of California and Georgia, the Cincinnati Child Poverty Collaborative, the Boeing Company, Hewlett Packard, Nissan, and Northwestern Mutual. Welcome, Chris, and thank you for joining us on today's broadcast. Thank you, Rachel. Pleased to be here. Today's present uh, webinar is um, Adaptive Learning, Three Enabling Competencies for Community Engagement. I wanted to start our conversation today by asking, what do you mean by enabling competencies? Well, thank you, Rachel. So um, I'd like to answer that question with a question. I mean, I'm kind of um, versed in politics speak these days, I suppose, so answering a question with a question might be appropriate. Um, but seriously, the, uh, the question I'd like to ask is, how are management and leadership and community change processes fads like sports? And um, I have a picture here of my daughter playing basketball. A few years ago, I was watching her um, run a fast break down uh, um, the, the court after she had uh, stolen the, ba the basketball. And uh, she had in her mind a play that she was going to run. And then she dri double dribbled on the way and was unable to execute it. And it reminds me of that uh, you can have a play like uh, the triangle offense, which is a beautiful play in, ba in basketball. Um, you can also have plays in hockey, um, for those of you that are from Canada. But if you have a play um, like basketball where you want to run the triangle offense, it's absolutely impossible to run that if you can't pass, dribble, and shoot. And the way I like to think about it is that you have lots of uh, process du jours that come and go. Um, I've been around long enough to see total quality management, leading change, re-engineering, lean engineering, Six Sigma, and we're now uh, in the uh, community phases of uh, collective impact being the process or the approach du jour. And if you asked people in those different fields or when they were popular or still are popular, some of the things that need to be done, they would say, well, we need to get people together, work across boundaries, we need uh, you know, to establish a vision, we need to have measurement and performance, we need to set targets and all that other stuff. Um, and they're all common to those things. So if those things are common, why are they so different and why do they not execute them well? And to me, it comes down to the fact that um, you're really needing to be able to have the skill sets required to, uh, to execute it. So for example, with collective impact, which is uh, you know, one of the reasons many of you are on the phone call today, um, you have a guide here that Tamarack and Vibrant Communities have produced around guides for cities for reducing poverty. And you know, one of the, uh, the points, uh, one of the, uh, the, the activities is to make sure you do citywide initiatives and the other one is to end with collective impact. And in doing these things, um, it's been described by those who um, you know, sort of developed this approach and now work on the approach that there are conditions that allow collective impact to work effectively. Having a common agenda, uh, doing shared measurement, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and backbone support. And all of those things are sort of ideas or, you know, we should be doing these things. They're activities. And in order to support those, uh, there's the softer dimensions that, um, you know, Kanye and company have said were left out of this particular article that I've got listed here, saying we've left out the softer dimensions about relationship and trust building and working with diverse stakeholders, and leadership development, and creating a culture of learning. And it's the ability to do those things that um, the enabling competencies, I think, support. So these enabling competencies work on the softer side of things, which actually, um, as many of us know, can be the hard part of any change effort. 
and so the, the competencies that um, I work with and my colleagues work with are um, competencies that support adaptive learning. And these competencies include systems thinking, conversational capacity, and um, a suite of competencies that we call yes to the mess. Chris, you just mentioned adaptive learning, and many of our viewers might be familiar with Ron Heifetz's work on adaptive leadership. Can you describe how adaptive learning relates to the enabling competencies and to the concept of adaptive leadership? Yes, so for those of you that are or aren't even familiar with uh, Ron Heifetz's work around adaptive leadership, um, he um, looks at problems as sort of following along a continuum, and then one end of the continuum um, are what he defines as technical problems. My colleague Craig Weber, I think, more accurately refers to these as routine problems, because there's a routine for dealing with them. So these are problems that are easily defined, there's an obvious and proven solution, and there's an expert out there that can help solve the problem. So in essence, there's a routine for solving them. So if I break my knee, um, there is a routine for fixing that. The surgeon or the orthopedic um, you know, professional at the hospital knows how to execute it. And it's obviously easily defined because it's a broken knee. Um, if there's some other issue in an organization, like you know, something breaks down, like a computer system, there's usually a routine and an expert to call on that can help fix that. So in other words, there's a routine for dealing with the problem. Um, as far as adaptive challenges, which are the, on the other end of the spectrum, these are basically the opposite. They're not easily defined. In fact, multiple people see the problem differently. There isn't a clear solution. No one's won the Nobel Prize for solving poverty or for fixing health care. Um, and there's, there's no expert out there that could solve it that would have that Nobel Prize. So there's, the, on these side, on this end of the spectrum, they're fundamentally different. These are challenges that have no solution that's out there. And basically, um, if you are on the side where there's a routine, once you've diagnosed the problem, you should go fix it. Why just sit there, right? But if you've defined the problem as undefinable, in other words, there's a variety of opinions on what's going on, uh, then there's um, absolutely um, no reason to just jump into action. You should start learning. You should figure out what's going on, why it's going on, come together and develop a process by which you can build understanding collectively. So often our preferred strategy is we love routine problems. We love to like solve them with our analytical minds and say there's a routine, let's fix it that way. But you get into trouble when you try to solve an adaptive challenge that way. You come up with the five-step process or the, the strategic binder filled with these four initiatives. And so what we'd like to think about is using these enabling competencies as an approach or a process that um, supports the finding of leverage in the system, places where you can actually make some improvement. That's what we call finding leverage. Okay, so you're talking about leverage here, which I think is a concept that many of us have heard of. Um, but why don't you say how you're defining it, why you think it's important? Okay. Well, um, I have a definition that's a little sophisticated around leverage. Um, and uh, I first of all start off with the problem itself, which is you want to fundamentally improve it. You don't want to just tweak around the edges. So if you're dealing with a poverty rate that's in the 30% or the 20% range or something like that, taking it down to 19% from 20%, that's tweaking it. That's a minor improvement. And again, it's not a minor improvement for those whose poverty has been reduced um, or who have been um, you've seen their quality of life improved. However, that's not really a fundamental improvement. And so I think those of us on this call here would think of wanting to fundamentally improve it, dramatically reduce poverty. And we'd also like to be able to do it with the resources we have without like spending billions and billions of dollars. You can obviously reduce poverty by giving everybody a lot of money, um, but A, we don't have it, and B, that doesn't seem feasible and it's not really a sustainable solution. So we want to find a way to fundamentally improve what we're doing using sort of efficient, efficient use of resources, time, and effort. So that's one part of uh, leverage. But I think there's other components to it. And I think that if we look at leverage as not only fundamentally improving the issue that we're focused on, but we want to make sure other things occur or don't occur. And in this case, I'm referring to something not occurring, which I refer to as the COBRA effect. So the COBRA effect is where something gets fixed in the short term, but in the long term, it gets worse again. Um, this comes from uh, a phenomenon that occurred in India when uh, the British were ruling there. 
and there were a bunch of cobras running around on the streets. I don't know if there's a flock of cobras or a gaggle of cobras or whatever you call them, but there were a lot of cobras running around. And so the British government um, provided an incentive program. Basically, there was, um, you know, if you brought in a cobra head, you could get a bounty on them. And this dramatically reduced the number of cobras for a while because their villagers were incentivized to bring in cobra heads. However, they were also incentivized to breed cobras to get more cobra heads. So what happened is that once the British realized that the uh, India uh, population was um, using cobra breeding practices to, uh, to make money, they stopped with the incentive program. Unfortunately, the villagers, uh, the population, just released the cobras in the streets. And this has occurred in a variety of places around the world, even um, where you're trying to reduce emissions in um, cities by incentivizing people or basically penalizing people, keeping them from driving with certain license plate numbers on certain days of the week. Um, in Mexico City, they tried that. And what happened was is that people just got two clunky cars and drove them on the different days of the week and ended up putting more emissions in the air. So Cobra effect is where you fix it now, but it gets worse later, and you want to avoid that. That's not leverage. You also want to avoid um, what I call the parachuting cats phenomena, and this is when the World Health Organization ended up in the 1950s parachuting 10,000 cats into Borneo. Um, the story goes that uh, what happened is that there was malaria, so they sprayed DDT to kill the mosquitoes, which did get rid of the malaria, but um, what happened was is this killed the geckos, which ate um, the caterpillars, um, so the caterpillar population um, exploded and ate the villagers' roofs. Um, worse yet, um, it killed cats that were responsible for keeping the rat population in control. So what happened is the rat population exploded, and then we got such wonderful diseases as plague and typhus. So they did fix the malaria problem, but they created a lot of other problems and ended up having to parachute 10,000 cats into Borneo to solve the other problems that were created. So leverage is fundamentally improving with an efficient use of resources. It's avoiding a cobra effect, and it's avoiding the parachuting cats phenomenon. We also want to do something where we multi-solve or find the wolf. And this find the wolf idea comes from Yellowstone in the United States where um, they released um, some wolves, reintroduced the wolf population to Yellowstone after it had been um, removed for so long um, because the elk population was growing. And as they put in the wolves, um, the elk population um, actually was reduced this allowed more vegetation to grow, and when the trees grew, it brought more beavers and beaver colonies, and what ended up happening is that the beavers um, were responsible for creating dams, and the soil erosion was eliminated. So more wolves, less deer, more vegetation, more trees and beavers, more dams, and er erosion was reduced. So finding the wolf solved that problem, I uh, solved the deer problem, it also created a, a more rich and vibrant ecosystem. So when I say finding the wolf um, as a point of leverage is if you can find a solution where um, you fix not only one problem you're working on but several other problems, that would be a high leverage uh, solution because you're um, really able to efficiently work on multiple issues in a system. So this uh, concept of leverage is fundamental to the, uh, the core competency or the enabling competency I refer to as systems thinking. Great. Um, while you were speaking, I learned that a group of cobras is called a quiver. So thank you very much, David. Um, I wanted to go back and ask you a little bit more about systems thinking and leverage and how does systems thinking help one find leverage in a system? Thank you. Uh, the leverage is, um, again, fundamental to systems thinking because of a core or foundational principle. So um, I'm going to use a system here where I'm going to ask you a question out of the audience. And you don't really need to type in the answer, but um, I'm going to hold this um, in a position where I've got my hand underneath it. And when I um, remove the hand, I'm going to ask you, what's the cause of this behavior? Now, if you're like most people, the first thing that jumps to mind is something like gravity or removing the hand. 
and it is true that gravity and removing the hand would um, are, are, are part of this. They're necessary for that behavior. But if I grab that glass of water that's sitting there and held it the very same way to remove my hand, you would not get the same behavior, right? So what you might want to do is to rethink the causality there. Certainly a mental model that has gravity or removing the hand in it does contain some elements of the truth. But it's not that useful because you can't change gravity if you wanted to um, improve the behavior. And if the removing of the hand is something outside of your control, let's say if you're in Canada and the U.S. election changes your economy, um, you're not able to, uh, to respond to that. Or if you're in the U.S. and Brexit changes your economy, you can't respond to that. So if things are outside of your control or if things are gravity and really uninfluenceable, and your mental model is that those are the causes, not that useful. However, if I assume that the cause of gra or the cause of the oscillation is the um, is the structure itself, then I can spend some time working on that structure in such a way so that the next time the hand is removed and gravity still is operating, um, I get better behavior. I would say this is now a more resilient system, wouldn't you? So. The, the fundamental principle here that we're focusing in on is if you have a mental model um, and you want to, and the mental model really is a theory about how things work, the most useful one is to focus in on the structure, the structure that's generating the behavior. So a little bit more I'll go into this example here. Assume you're in a company and you're on the executive team and last quarter's profits were negative in the, in the red down here, down below the uh, break-even line. How would you feel? Not so good, right? What would you do? Most likely you would um, lay off the people. Um, you would work on um, you know, strategies that are cost reduction strategies, so reactionary. If over the last year you had found that profits had uh, plummeted from a high of positive down to this low negative, you would be really perplexed and more likely to also be in a reactionary mode, right? Very emotionally uh, distraught perhaps and looking for someone to blame. However, if you go further back, um, your strategies would be um, fundamentally different. You would be thinking more and more about how you could, um, um, if you saw this behavior, for example, um, you would come up with a strategy that says, oh, this is normal, and it's a seasonal business, so during the down times, I might want to diversify my business. If I sell, sell snowboards in the winter in Vermont, I might want to also sell um, golf clubs in the summer, or for example. So I get a more um, proactive stance. Um, I could also invest more in the R&D in the downturns so that I grow more and more during the upturns. So I become much more proactive and much more in control of my fate. And so if you have a longer time horizon that you're looking at, that's a part of a systems thinking framework. And then if you use that view, that time horizon, to say what's the structure that's generating it, then you have an opportunity for making change. So the fundamental principle of systems thinking is to link the behavior that you're trying to change to the structure that's generating it so that you have an opportunity to make those changes to the structure to get the behavior you want. Unlike the slinky, which you can see, the stuff that we work with in communities is unseen. Therefore, we use tools to map things out, to see things um, in ways to make improvements. So the fundamental principle of systems thinking is structure drives behavior. We ask questions that help us to see further, expand our field of vision, what's missing, what sectors need to be included. We focus on how things work, what's the physics of this. We ask questions where we're looking for leverage, and we try to build a useful picture together, a visual picture, um, and I'll have some examples of that shortly. So you've told us about systems thinking, um, but you've also mentioned some other competencies. Tell us a little bit about those and why they're necessary. Okay. Well, conversational capacity, um, so the systems thinking is about finding leverage. Conversational capacity is how do you have people have most effective conversations to look at leverage. And so if we look at that particular discipline, then we can see that it starts off with a sweet spot in the middle. And conversational capacity, if you're in the sweet spot, you're having learning, focused, balanced um, conversations. This is where good work is done. So if you want to be in a place where there's open, balanced, non-defensive conversations, um, you find that sometimes we fly out of the sweet spot. 
we move to places where um, either um, we lose um, our candor or we lose curiosity. And so the skills of conversational capacity allow us um, in situations where it may be easy to fly off the handle, so to speak, to fly out to the ends of the behavioral spectrum, to come back in using candor and curiosity to balance that, to make sure that we're getting everything out on the table and able to wrestle with it in a way where we're all learning. And that's the, uh, the skill of conversational capacity. Um, as far as um, systems, or as far as the yes to the mess component, um, we have the skill sets here that come from the field of jazz. And it's a mindset and principles that go along with improvisation. So uh, we have an affirmative bias. We can jump in, we can make a difference, um, we can learn as we go. Um, so it focuses on learning, not knowing things ahead of time. Um, we can have um, sort of the ability to solo and share and work together um, in ways that everybody is taking turns um, supporting each other and we make sure that the structure is designed for maximum flexibility. That's what a jazz band does and we can organize our communities. In fact, that's the only way really to organize uh, multiple groups kind of working on issues in a community is to have this sort of minimal structure and maximum flexibility. Those were great. Let's get to some examples where um, you've seen these enabling competencies and where they've been applied. Um, can you say a little bit about how they have helped um, those change processes and even some places where um, you found some challenges? Sure. So um, one of the areas that I've uh, worked in recently is with uh, the Child Poverty Collaborative in Cincinnati. And they were trying to fundamentally reduce child poverty and we're still working working on this. So it's been the first year. So um, in this first year, we've worked with a steering committee that's had representation from across the community, from business and faith and education, um, different sectors, and, and also providers. Um, and the strategy was to not only try to solve the problem, but in solving the problem to build the capacity of a steering committee and the community to engage in adaptive learning. So in the process, we've built the capacity of the steering committee in these three competencies that I've shown here. Um, we've held community conversations in churches and schools, working with a local community organizer who was highly respected in the community. And so she was able to really um, marshal a whole lot of resources and develop the capacity of people to have good conversations. And then we've held two large summits um, with 600 to 700 people at each summit attending. And in the summits, we actually engaged them in a collaborative process. So we showed, we showed the, uh, um, the map that was drawn here on the right. This is a systems map that shows how all the pieces of the system fit together um, to generate the poverty that we're trying to, uh, to work on and reduce. And as you can see, there are many topics in there that include things like you know, health and financial stability and jobs, all the way to racism and violence and incarceration. And by allowing people to see how this fit into this larger system, they were able to gather around the table. We gave them this map, and they were able to point at areas where they could. Uh, they found resonance. Yes, I can tell a story right here, but they can also start seeing how you know this isn't a band aid. You can't just fix one area. You need to really have a multi pronged, multi systemic approach to it, and could see that everyone has a stake in it. Um, from employers to the faith community, etc. So we use this as a map as a way to say what's missing, um, what areas should we focus on, how should we prioritize, and it was a really valuable um, tool or process for doing that. The strategy that's come out of it that we're now moving into in the next year um, has multi-phases. So we use this pyramid to kind of rearrange and shape around the, the streams of areas of focus. So at the top of it is areas where we're working on programs that are going to, to help people find jobs and get skills needed, et cetera, to do that. Um, but below that, we're going to start working on the systems that support them, um, including the transportation system and the child care system, et cetera. But then there's this social system underneath it um, where you're trying to develop a nurturing environment that may be at odds with the racism and violence that's going on there. So how can we attack and work on those? So there'll be some streams of work at that, but ultimately the community capacity at the bottom, which is an adaptive leadership capacity that we're talking about here, um, is what will help support the ability to do all of the above. And so the efforts moving forward will include those. That's, um, Cincinnati is a great community example. Many of the participants today 
are also working in state and federal governments. Can these competencies be useful there? Yes. So um, just a few weeks ago, I sat down with a colleague um, at UCLA. His name is Neil Halfen, and he's been doing a lot of work at the national level here in the United States and uh, showed me this chart and gave me permission to show it here. Um, you can see that there are different levels. You know, the community level is kind of in the middle here, but you can also use and apply these skills at the individual or the programmatic level, um, and you can also apply them at the city, uh, at the county, or even the national level. So, for example, working in the state of Georgia um, with children's behavioral health, um, they had a system where they had children in different uh, parts of the system. Some were in institutions, some were in communities, and there was a goal to get uh, more and more children with families in the community. So we gathered stakeholder groups from behavioral health, public health, juvenile justice, education, even parent advocacy groups. And we worked together, again, building their um, capacities to use these three competencies. Um, we developed a conversational capacity um, code that they all used to work together when they were uh, meeting. And we used mapping, stock and flow mapping uh, that you see here to think about how they would want to improve that system. And they found by remapping it, so this was the map that we developed originally, we developed another map that helped them to see how they could all coordinate and work together in different parts of the system um, in a way more effectively. And so they were able to see how their roles fit um, in other parts of it. Because you can see right here, if you look at it here, it's easy to say, well, as long as these kids are in my part of the system, I need resources to take care of them. Um, and if they're outside of it, they're no longer of my concern by redrawing and rethinking about how the system was um, being designed and what was important, they were able to focus more upstream um, and see that they all needed to work together. And so this was a uh, process that worked very well there. Um, and you can also see it working like that um, even with national um, systems, if you would like to put it that way. So um, in order to, uh, to put it all together, if you want to go back to the, uh, the collective impact piece, which again a lot of you are here for, um, there's these activities or conditions which um, we all would like to, to see as part of a collective impact process. But by combining these three skill sets, these three competencies, there's a meta competency. It's the ability really to, you know, like in basketball, not only to be able to pass, dribble, and shoot, but by coordinating all those to have sort of a range or a view of the whole court to know what to do, where to do, and how to do it, um, the competencies when you put them together really create sort of the, the Michael Jordans or the Larry Birds or the Magic Johnsons or now we would call them the LeBron James of the game. So if participants wanted to use these skills, how can they begin learning and applying them? Well, um, there isn't anything out there that actually shows how they all go together. So this slide set here is describing a little bit of that, about that and there's a, uh, um, a, a white paper that we're developing uh, now that will help to put them together. But you can see how they fit based upon looking at the, at the, the webinar here, I believe. And uh, there are books out there by colleagues uh, that I think are, are exemplary for teaching these competencies. So Frank Barrett, um, who teaches the Naval Postgraduate School, um, as well as was a jazz uh, pianist for the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra, wrote a really nice book here, uh, Harvard Business Review, on Yes to the Mess. That's a great book for the, the principles of jazz and improvisation and how to apply them. Um, and he's got lots of examples of organizations and communities using them. Uh, Craig Weber's book on conversational capacity, I think, is the, the most accessible book out there on practical tools for learning conversations. So that's uh, another good resource for you. Um, for systems thinking, a um, um, couple of uh, mentors and colleagues of mine um, wrote some books, and so they're here, Thinking in Systems and an Introduction to Systems Thinking um, by Barry Richmond, um, and the Thinking in Systems was by Danella Meadows. Both of those books are excellent. Um, my website also has a list of these resources as well as some videos, including some videos I did with the CDC that are on the CDC um, TV channel. Um, and so if you go to my website, you can see a uh, video series. There are three 10-minute videos that talk about the mindset and the skills of systems thinking. So those, those videos might be the best places to go if you want to see how to apply these skills in the systems thinking world through the CDC uh, YouTube uh, or the CDC TV website. 
Great. Well, thanks, Chris. This has been really interesting and useful. Um, today, you introduced us to three skills, or as you called them, enabling competencies that people working on change processes may want to incorporate into the work. There was systems thinking, which is the ability to find leverage in complex issues, and conversational capacity, which is being able to have productive, balanced conversations about difficult topics. And finally, yes to the mess, um, the ability to orchestrate learning in messy situations using skills of improvisation. And I feel like you really made a case that these competencies are just as important as the change process itself. So thank you. And now um, we are going to move into the question and answer session part of our call today. I'm going to start with a few questions that were submitted in advance of today's broadcast. And while we do this, we encourage you to submit your questions through the question box in your control panel, and we will do our best to get through um, all of them in the time we have allotted. So let me start with the first one. Um, the first, <clears throat> excuse me, the first question is, our community has multiple collective impact backbone organizations with some overlapping priorities and some more specific ones. There is a bit of collaboration fatigue, so many collective impact meetings going on. How do we coordinate among different collective impact backbone organizations? How do we maximize efforts um, so as to not burn people out and get folks to multiple important tables? That's an excellent question, and uh, I wish there was a, a, a very simple, concrete, routine solution fix for that. Um, but I, I would suggest a, a few things to consider in there, and we're also dealing with that um, in Cincinnati because Cincinnati, as many of you are well aware, is one of those leading collective impact places um, you know, where a lot of this has come from. So they, they, they do have some of that fatigue, and so some of the folks in the steering committee are also involved with some other um, projects that are going on. So we're, we're discussing and, and exploring this right now. Um, you know, one of the, the things that I, I would suggest would be helpful in these kind of situations is to run what I would consider an adaptive learning boot camp or a workshop. So rather than have everybody going to all the different meetings at different times would be to say let's set aside a day or two where all of the groups have some representation and come together and work on their issues but they also are building their enabling competencies together. So you're teaching them systems thinking, you're teaching them how to have conversations and you're teaching them to approach this from a jazz improvisational perspective. And by teaching the skills and then using some of the workshop to say, well, where's what we're doing over in this process similar to or support this process? And to use systems thinking mapping tools to map out and to understand where the, where the interdependencies are um, and where the, the discrete differences are. Um, and if you can have a, a, an overarching map of what's going on in a community so that people can see how the issues they're working on support these other issues, that would be really helpful. So I suggest a, a, a workshop where you get um, all the different groups coming together um, and teaching them some competencies and in applying the competencies they're actually applying them to their issues but then seeing how there's some interdependencies. So that may actually reduce some um, redundancies in the system. And ultimately you would probably find, I think, like we're finding in Cincinnati, that there might be a few guiding implementation principles around these that if all processes in the community are working on things like reducing inequity, um, working more cross-sectorally, um, enhancing the social, um, emotional capital of the community or a few other things, if everything you're doing is trying to do that, then all boats are being lifted by that. So you might find by working together that you have some um, shared principles of how to act and operate that when applied will help everybody. Great. Your answer, I think, um, also contributes to a question asked by one of the participants. Um, she asked, is this meta competency learnable? And you seem to talk a little bit about that, but is there anything else you want to add to that? 
Um, yes, it, it is learnable. I, I think that um, if you read uh, the materials that are uh, you know, that I've listed there, you'll see that there's these, these questions that um, are sort of behind everything. Like, are, am I designing this for maximum flexibility? Am I, um, am I embracing errors as an opportunity for learning rather than suppressing them? Um, am I, um, you know, really putting forth a clear position and argument and reasoning, and then opening up to inquiry and questioning and testing of that? There's some questions that are actually very demonstrable, and you can start practicing them and using them. Uh, there's nothing that actually pulls them all together into this meta competency yet, uh, unfortunately, but um, you can figure that out as you as you go along. Great. Another question. Um is how do people engage reluctant participants who may be defensive, including leaders who feel their approach is the best and the only way to proceed? Um, well, that really is going to require, I think, a good use of um, both systems thinking and conversational capacity. And uh, what I mean by that is you know, you're, if you go in or if I go into a situation and I want somebody to do it my way, um, without really exploring what are the reasons behind why they want to do it their way and understanding what's the price that's paid if they continue to do it their way or what's the price that I might pay if I do not learn how to do it their way. So I think you need to, to come at it with a mindset where I may be missing something and also thinking that they may be missing something and if we could reframe or rethink it, how could we get them to be engaged? And so my colleague Craig Weber is all you know, he's very vehement about saying, you know, if you if you want to work with someone, be very clear about what's the price that's being paid for either not working on it or for the issue continuing. Um, and that becomes clearer sometimes with systems thinking. And so often in systems thinking, I draw out those trend graphs saying, okay, here's here's what's been happening historically. Um, you know, we're seeing poverty has been rising sort of gradually for a while, or diabetes has been, uh, or obesity has been rising gradually for a while. But the way it's heading is it's going to grow like this. It's going to be much more exponential. It's going to double in the next, you know, 10, 20 years or something like that. If you can show what's the potential price paid if this issue is not addressed, you're more likely to engage people in the process of working on it with you. But again, back to the, the first stances. If you go in thinking that you have the answer or the way to do it and your job is to convince them to do it, that is most likely going to fail. It needs to be an opportunity for thinking about how is it that working on this together we could um, solve something or some things that we all care about. One participant would really love to hear your tips on creating value around systems thinking and facilitated discussions from within a large top-down, perhaps government organization. Um, well, that's that, that's interesting. So there's uh, you know a few ways to to do that. I mean, the 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 typical way that we usually uh, you know try to exhort is that uh, you know well you need to change leadership's mind or you're not going to get it done, right? So it's a selling job to leadership, and um, that certainly can work. And if you can find um, someone in leadership who is open um, and uh, you know relatively um, willing to listen and think about ideas and you could get an audience with them, get them some materials, get around systems thinking. Um, some of the videos I have on my website are actually I think pretty good at that. Um, at least they have been fairly effective both for uh, the CDC and the National Association for Chronic Disease Directors. We've used them um, to get leadership uh, interested in systems thinking. Um, but then you think it's also just start where you are. There's, uh, you know, there's the Arthur Ashe quote that I use sometimes, which is use what you have, do what you can, start with you are, something like that. Um, but we got to, it's just wherever you're at in the system, whatever part of that system you have some control or boundaries around um, is to start applying systems thinking there and to make some, um, you know, progress and then to demonstrate that to others around and to, really have opportunities for sharing the work within the organization or within the community. Great. Um, Celia was asking if there are any examples of this kind of work being done in more rural settings. Um, 
Well, I'm trying to think about using this in rural areas. So we did some uh, work in Minnesota around the Minnesota River uh, project where we actually engaged folks in uh, in rural communities looking at um, the issues that uh, that they had to relate to in terms of you know farm runoff um, impacts on the river and other kinds of things and so um, yes it has been used there um, it's a little bit more challenging in some cases you still have to find the audience and sometimes it's harder to gather people together um, but the principles of, of seeing how things fit together in a system and how they all uh, you know work together um, you know those principles you know still apply at a rural setting um, another example that we have on that is in Georgia where we looked at um, children's behavioral health issues in a rural setting so um, even though we were working at a at a higher level we were working at the more of the state level with folks um, we were able to look at an issue that was occurring in the rural communities um, and get expertise from the rural communities to look at that issue together and to figure out ways to, to make some improvement there. So um, you can you can use it there as well. Great. Um, Aaron has a rather long question. I'm going to see if I can summarize some of it. Um, they're transitioning from nine health authorities to two health authorities in Nova Scotia. And he does see the application of using these um, three competencies and, and having that be effective. But right now kind of in that interim are there ways or strategies that someone on the front line like himself could apply um, any of this as a health promoter in public health so how do those folks on the ground who maybe can't um, get it up into the all the working parts of the organization how can how can they just start and do something um, well, I, I think that there's a, you know, a variety of ways to do that, and it, it kind of depends on where you're at in the in the organization, even on the front lines, and the types of issues you're working on. But um, it's certainly learning conversational capacity, figuring out ways to have better conversations, both with those that you're serving as well as those in the uh, um, sort of in the management leadership chain is a, is a really good useful tool that will help and pay off. So I would certainly recommend reading the, the conversational capacity book and seeing if you can find some issues where just having a better, more productive conversation would get you some more leverage with the people you're working with. Um, I would then think about, um, you know, uh, how to um, think about the issues you're working on more from an expanded boundary point of view. So how can you work with the people you're working with, um, maybe you know, a few people in leadership nearby, up, a, you know, a one or two levels up, uh, people that are part of that system at your, the level you're at as well as those you're serving, how might you be able to tackle an issue that could be bounded by that group um, and use a systems approach to doing it. So thinking about how that particular um, issue is a shared issue across um, a different folks and how they might all benefit from seeing how their collective parts of the issue, collective parts of the elephant, so to speak, all fit together. So I would, I would certainly work on the conversational capacity components just to have better conversations and to be able to have more influence. Um, I would work on finding a, a problem that you could tackle at that level where systems thinking can help, but again, make it as sort of as broad as possible. Um, and then I would also, you know, obviously read up on the the improvisational techniques that are listed there. In particular, what might be helpful is to just revisit this concept in there of uh, affirmative bias, which is a a jazz principle, meaning. You know, I don't know what I'm about to play, but I'm just going to jump in and do it because I'm going to make something happen. And sometimes that may be that leap in the net up here may be the uh, the only option you have sometimes. Um, so that's a that's a useful um, sort of uh, way of thinking about it at the improvisational level. But back to the conversational capacity, definitely learn that. Work on the systems thinking around a particular issue. And if you want to also take um, the issues that you're thinking about um, and kind of map it out in a way that you can then share with people around the organization. Here's a way of approaching the problem. You might be able to uh, to generate a little bit more uh, interest in it um, as you move forward. So hopefully that was helpful. That was a lot of different things that I just mentioned there. But Great. So of the three competencies that you've described today, uh, if there's an existing collaborative, is there a competency that is better to start with or one that you might recommend to boost the group's efforts? Um, you know, it really depends on what the, what the problem is uh, that you're, you're faced 
interesting. So if there's an existing collaborative and you feel like people aren't putting their issues on the table, the agendas aren't being shared, then the conversational capacity may be the best place to start. Um, if you've got a, uh, a group that kind of seems, uh, seems stuck, like you know, they just keep meeting and not getting anywhere, it may be that uh, you know, they need to have more of an improvisational, well, let's just try some stuff. Let's see if we can find some pilot programs to run or if we can find some ideas and, and just do something and get going and see what we can learn from it. So it might be more of an improvisational um, approach. And you may find that if there's a lot of different things that are going on and you don't see that they're all like, you know, moving forward, you don't feel like you're making any progress in, in, in any area, then it may be that a systems thinking lens might be helpful. So let's all stop for a minute, back up and reflect. What's the issue we're working on? How does all this fit together um, and take more of a systems approach? So I guess given where the collective or the collaborative or the collectives are, um, you kind of then use that and diagnose and figure out which of the competencies might be most helpful at the time. Great. Um, Rachel is um, asking about um, or, or bringing up the issue that I think a lot of us um, have experienced, that even though you can recognize the value of these kind of approaches, um, it's often very hard for people to let go of the business as usual. Do you have any successful examples of very risk-averse organizations that have shifted to a more iterative, improvisational culture? Hmm. Well, um, that's a great question, and uh, I've worked, um, you know, with um, you know a, a financial organization that's you know pretty risk-averse um, by working through um, a mapping process where we surfaced how um, parts of the IT system were working or not working, um, they actually found that uh, where they'd been investing a lot of their time and energy was around something that they thought was going to be fundamental improvement, uh, but it was also sort of the safe thing to do. And by going through a collaborative process where we kept checking assumptions and mapping them out and then saying, are you sure that's the way it works? And what if we did it this way and that way? By actually mapping it out at one point, they were able to say, huh, we've been spending a lot of time, money, and energy on an area that's not that effective. Let's try something new and different. And so they are now in the process of doing that. Um, but it really was necessary for them to see and to feel that this was going on and it wasn't something that could be done in a sort of a day session so we met over the course of several months and as the process of unraveling what was going on and mapping it out and getting clearer and clearer um, occurred they were more willing to take and jump into that risk so I think it's really being able to see what you've been doing is keeping you stuck, or as Craig Weber would say, you're still on the hamster wheel. And once people get tired of being on the hamster wheel and are clear they're on it, um, it's easier to get them to get off of that thing. So Tori's asking about, um, about the system and maybe the boundaries of the system. Um, do you recommend mapping the system that leads to the problem or the system that supports positive outcomes or some com combination? Oh, that's a great question. Um, obviously, some experience with systems thinking or systems analysis behind that question. So um, how I um, approach this, and not everybody in my field approaches it this way, but the way I approach it is I first start with what's the behavior that we want to influence the most? And it may be a behavior in the past that's been going in a bad direction. And it may be starting now, here's a behavior into the future that we would like to see start to get better and better or to occur. Or perhaps I can kind of combine those. But ultimately I start with the behavior and then say, if I was to try to figure out the cause of this behavior and boil it down to one or two things, what would those be? And I would start bounding it with that and then say, is there something causing those things that I might also need to be adding to get the picture of it? So I'm basically doing the, uh, the Occam's razor, keep this as simple as possible but no simpler approach. And so rather than starting with how do I map everything that's in the system and see what happens, I'll start with, here's the behavior we most want to see into the future. What's the minimum boundary, the minimum structure I need to be able to understand and to work on that? So 
Start with the behavior first, then what's the structure needed to generate that? Great. We have just a few more minutes during our question and answer period, so I want to encourage any other um, lingering questions to please type them in. Uh, you mentioned the conversational code of conduct, I believe, and Patricia was wondering if that's anything you could share or perhaps you could give some examples of what might be included in something like that. Yeah, so um, first of all, I think there is an article that you can download from uh, Craig Weber's um, website. So if you go out there and look up uh, Craig Weber um, in conversational capacity, you'll find a website um, that he's got an article on the conversational codes of conduct and how organizations can develop them. He comes from a very business side of things, so a lot of his examples are in the business community, um, but the concept is still the same. Um, you know, in communities that I've worked with, you know, they've had the conversational code of conducts, um, you know, that include in them um, not only the four skill sets um, of the um, of the conversational co uh, conversational capacity approach, um, which are things like state your position clearly, present all the reasoning behind it, um, be open to testing your um, ideas and opinions. Um, and be willing to dive into people, other people's ideas and opinions. Those are parts of the code of conduct that you would find. You would also find things like, you know, you know, we will work in this. Um, you know, we will we will um, prioritize learning over um, personal, um, you know, benefit. Um, you know, be learning over being right. Um, so learning is, um, you know, a priority to us. Um, sharing valid information, free and informed choice is, um, you know, a value that we hold. So you can find several components of a code of conduct in what I just said, um, and then we let groups also kind of operate from that. But I do recommend the article by uh, Craig Weber if you can locate that. And if not, contact me and I'll find it for you. So in our last minute, let's um, end with a question around data. Uh, how do you ensure your organization is collecting the right data to be able to track trends for big picture systems thinking? Uh, excellent question. This is the uh, proverbial chicken and the egg kind of thing. So um, I'm going to end this with, a, with an anecdote that I often use, which is um, you know, there's a, a fellow walking home at night and he sees somebody um, crawling on the ground underneath his street lamp and he says, uh, what are you doing, can I help you? And the guy says, well, I'm looking for my keys. So this, other, this new fellow that just came up gets down on his hands and knees and starts crawling around as well. Um, and they're looking for a while and finally he turns to the person that had been there and he said, we can't find your keys, um, can you just kind of tell me where under this light we, you may have lost them? And the guy says, oh, I didn't lose them under the light here. And he says, well, where did you lose them? And the guy says, well, I lost them over there under the bushes. And he goes, well, why aren't we looking there? He goes, well, there's no light over there. And the point of that is, is that we often look for solutions or we often are trying to focus in on places where we already have data or where the data is easiest to collect. And sometimes that's not where we need to be looking. And so what we do in systems thinking work is we map out and say, okay, what do we currently know? What's the data we have? But also, what's the issue that we're trying to understand? And what must be the causal chain of the system generating or working on that issue? And sometimes parts of that chain are things we do not have data on. So then we use that to say, okay, we need to get and collect data on that stuff too because it's important. And then as you collect data on that stuff, like um, the social network analysis sometimes is a, is a good tool for finding things out that you don't know or looking at sort of the level of trust or um, in the United States we have Burfus, so what's your, how well do you feel like hope or grit or other kinds of things. So some things like that may not be collected and you need to go out and get it. And then when you get that, you improve your quality of your map, and then you realize there's other data that you need better. Um, so you'll find that this is an iterative thing, and so they, they go well together. Well, looking at the time, uh, this brings us to the end of our question period. Thank you again, Chris, Thank for you. sharing the concept of adaptive learning and these practical um, competencies with us. And uh, Thank you to all who attended today as well for your thoughtful questions. Um, so stay in touch with Vibrant Community Cities Reducing Poverty. Uh, you can receive the latest thinking news tools and resources from around the poverty reduction community by subscribing to um, Vibrant Communities monthly newsletter. 
there is also an upcoming webinar uh, Thursday, January 26th at 12 o'clock Eastern, Making Your Story Matter More, Positioning Challenging Social Issues for Maximum Engagement with Jeff Sage and Lindsay Sage of um, Sage Communications. So uh, to register, you can, um, there will be a, a follow-up uh, email that will be sent out where you can register. Coming up in person next spring, Vibrant Communities Canada is hosting their third annual national gathering of cities reducing poverty with a focus on how to best conduct multi-sectoral poverty reduction work and in particular, key roles that the business sector can play. 2017 summit in Hamilton, Ontario will build on learning from the two successful events in Ottawa and Edmonton. The exciting three-day learning agenda will run from April 4th through April 6th. The website is now launched and we encourage you to explore the highlights, the experience, and con uh, considering to register or holding a seat now. The URL is on the screen and will also be sent to you in the follow-up email. In a few days, you will receive our follow-up email with a link to an audio recording of today's call. You can email Natasha at natasha at tamarackcommunity.ca to provide feedback about today's webinar. We are always trying to improve on the experience. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very Bye -bye. much. Bye-bye.